today's episode, Liz and I sit down with Emil Harker and discuss practical tips and principles for turning conflict into connection. He shares some helpful insights on communication, conflict, and connection. Emil is a licensed marriage and family therapist with nearly 20 years of experience. He is passionate about getting through the fluffy stuff to the real nuts and bolts that helps people deal with inevitable conflict and turn it into closeness. He's been on Channel 2 Fresh Living program for over 10 years now. He has worked with NBA, UFC, and NFL athletes. He has his own podcast called The Emil Show. His book, You Can Turn Conflict Into Closeness, has been well received by professional therapists and couples alike. We hope you enjoy the show. Hey friends, the doctors are in the house. Welcome to Stronger Marriage Connection. I'm your host, Dr. Dave Schramm here at Utah State, alongside my co-host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Liz Hale. We are bringing you the best research, the best resources, the tips and tools to help you have the marriage of your dreams. All right, now, today I'm excited to have an outstanding therapist, an author, an educator, a friend, a podcaster, and a Lake Powell enthusiast, <laughs> uh, Emil Harker, on the show today. Emil, welcome to the show. Now, you just visited one of the best places in, in my mind on earth, and that is Lake Powell, man. What were you doing down there? Absolutely. Oh, my gosh. Lake Powell is like a chunk of heaven, right? It is. And so I like to tell everybody that Lake Powell is dangerous. The water levels are so low. You probably shouldn't go. So I can keep it all to myself. You know? <laughs> That's right. But it's it was wonderful. We had um so I have a twin brother and so he's got a houseboat down there. And so um we about every year we do either a man camp, okay, which is a bunch of guys going down that it started out really informally. A bunch of guys went down there and uh probably four years ago and we we just had some really authentic real conversations mm -hmm. really open vulnerable stuff and when they we talked about being a better husband a better father a better man just you know it wasn't called man yes. camp it was just a bunch of guys the the response from their wives was so positive that they said oh. if they do this again next year you're going because <laughs> yeah. it was so nice to have you come back with a greater sense of focus on what you needed to do as a husband, father, and man. Yeah. Oh. So that's how it kind of started. And then this last one, we decided to just do a couples one. So husband and wives, four couples, way too much food, okay? A lot of surfing and some really deep dives into who we are as men, as women, as, as lovers. And it was just, I mean, at the end of the, uh, I got a text from one of the guys who's an architect. Okay. So usually the engineers are not like the lovey feely ones. He writes this big old paragraph about how appreciative he was to be able to go down and to have this, this atmosphere of openness and vulnerability and support and we all love each other now so it's just a beautiful experience and being in lake powell I mean, dave you know that that's that's part of heaven it is yeah oh yeah. man it's just magic happens so i've been on couple trips i've been on family trips down there um mm -hmm. and i have to so and, I, and i'm holding up for those who are watching i'm holding up emails um his book it's, it's you can turn conflict into closeness now i have to ask you because you have right yeah. at the beginning you talk about this wakeboarding you even have like pictures of this wakeboarding this awful <laughs> <And it might. laughs> you're watching this pro and then you you hit it and like tear your acl mcl or something and i'm thinking oh no that's right. that's the word so i have to ask you didn't do anything yeah. crazy on the wakeboard did you this time i have for i have just abandoned wakeboarding mm -hmm. and now i just surf okay because yeah, surfing, you're going like 10 and a half miles an hour. Yeah. And when you wipe out, you don't hurt yourself. That's right. It's really nice. And plus, you're right there like five feet off the back, yeah. hanging out, chatting, yeah. catching Swedish fish in yeah. your mouths as a, you know, as, as to, to level it up. It's it's fun. Yeah. Yeah, that is so much fun. Oh, man. Well, well tell us. Let me, let's me let jump into your book. Tell us why you yeah. wrote the book. I mean, you tackle... Uh, first, I love that you talk about approaches to conflict. You talk about responses right. to conflict. So what, what made you write the book? Okay, so 
I went to Utah State University. Go Aggies. And the the education was top notch. Like the professors were almost like drill sergeants. They were rough. And I loved the that push to to really own therapy. And so we really got, I think, confident in therapeutic uh, strategies. But one of the things that I noticed was lacking in not only the the training, but also in literature was there was this gap on how to deal with conflict in the moment. There were strategies like um, a strategic therapy where you break the patterns of what was going on, the cycle of conflict by introducing something strange like give them a nickel or, you know, bring them a glass of water while they're angry. It's like, what are you doing to break the cycle of conflict? But what they lacked was how do I use that conflict, not just avoid it? Because it's, it's, it's absolutely unavoidable. It's inevitable. How do I use the conflict to create closeness? And the books that I've read on conflict were more like, you know, the art of war. Like it, it had nothing to do with closeness. It had win the argument kind of thing. So as a new husband, okay, who needed to work on communication, and as a new therapist that was craving strategies, the nuts and bolts of dealing with conflict when it happens, not before it happens or after, but the nitty gritty when, when the relationship can be made or broken. Because how that interaction is dealt with will lead to a breakthrough with greater commitment, closeness and intimacy, or three days on the couch with not talking to each other. So why isn't there more like energy in dealing with conflict? And so I decided, since I did all the research I could, and there's great books on conflict, okay, but they lack the nuts and bolts of conflict and how to deal with it. Or it's so sophisticated and complex, there's no way you're going to be able to access those strategies in the moment when your IQ drops 50 points and your limbic system's in action going, it's fight or flight. Like, I... <laughs> I'm going to be destroyed or I'm going to destroy you. So one or the other. And that destroys relationships. So I became the lab rat at my own home of how am I going to handle situations in a way that I feel good and my wife loves me more. And so I would literally like script out different ways of responding. And then I would take the things that was working and share those with my clients. And I kept on trying to break it down into a simplified process to, to teach it so that anybody can have these skills. Well, after I had developed this model, I, I put it all together and started teaching and, and you know, sharing it. Um, I remember, uh, I don't know, right, 12, 15 years ago, I shared this at the Utah Association for Marriage and Family Therapy this these steps and it was like oh my gosh this is fantastic stuff and i was hearing this from really like these were the the therapists that i looked up to as like the most awesome guys they've been around forever and i'm like you're telling me this is fantastic i may be onto something and so i decided well i'm gonna write a book on it so i put it all together into a book now, mind you, I have ADHD. Okay, bad. It took me five years to write the book. And then, then, then to make matters worse, right? Like, talk about eating humble pie. I go to uh, the Utah Association for Marriage and Family Therapy conference where Dr. Gottman was presenting. And this voice in my head says, Emil, ask him to read your book and see if he'll endorse it or give you some feedback on it. Like, you can't approach yeah. Dr. Gottman. I mean, if you're in the zone here, you don't go see the god of yeah. therapy, right? Mr. Guru <laughs> Gottman, yeah. So, like three or four times, that voice comes in my head. You should talk to him. You should talk to him. You should talk to him. And I'm, I'm scared to death. 
So finally I go, what's he going to say? No? Okay. So I go to him. He's coming out of the restroom. I'm going into it. And I go, hey. <laughs> and I, I don't know what I said, but I'm sure it sounded really amazing. But I'm like, <laughs> right? I said something. <laughs> yep. And he goes, sure. Yeah, send it to me and I'll take a look at your book. Wow. So I send him my book. He doesn't get like two pages into it. And he says, I thought you were done with your book. Send it to me when you're done. Okay. That was like a punch right in the in chops, right? I'm like, oh, I was hoping that you'd give me feedback and then I would be able to modify things, whatever. Nope. A year goes by as I'm working on, you know, polishing this thing because I'm going to present it uh, to Dr. Gottman where he will bless it or throw it in the fire with hell, right? There you go, Zemo, your book, blah. And so a year goes by, I reach out to him and he goes, Emil who? Like, what? Did I make an agreement to read your book? I don't remember that. And I'm like, oh dear. Like, I've been putting a whole year, like, he's become my best friend in my mind. It's like watching a favorite TV show and you fall in love with the person and they don't know who you are. So I'm like, I've got been thinking about him. And he says, well, he says, I'm really busy right now. I'm flying to Korea. I really don't have time for this. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to be able to do this. So I'm like going, but I had that feeling. And I, so I said, Dr. Gottman, I realize that you have a, a big, you know, you got a lot on your plate. I'll make a deal with you. I want to hold you to what you said you're going to do because I truly believe in my heart of hearts that when you read it, that you'll like it. But I'll make a deal with you. If you can't get past the first few pages, don't read it. Don't don't say anything. Just ignore. Okay. I'll see what I can do. And I'm like, okay. So I did all I could do, right? I send in my book with some like Jewish pastry, you know, just like sweeten up the deal, see if I could bribe him or something, right? right. Nice. Well, he was gone when the Jewish pastry came, so he didn't eat any of it. And so his whole <clears throat> staff ate, you know, this rugula. <laughs> and you've got my book, Dave. Yeah. Right? Right in the back. What did I, all I got was an email from Dr. Gottman with this is all it said. It didn't say anything other than this quote, and that was it. Go ahead and read it. Yeah, it says, Email Harker's book, You Can Turn Conflict Into Closeness, addresses the most important problem that short circuits great communication, changing one's own character so that we can become better able to love. It's a must read for anyone who is dedicated to loving well. The piece that I was so grateful he said, he said, it helps change our character. Yeah. The process isn't some kung fu technique to, to, to seduce or get what you want. The process of the communication steps changes our nature. Mm. Like you cannot fake this without having a change of heart. So when he wrote that, I swear it was like angels had penned this for him. I was like, I couldn't have written a better one myself. Yeah. Because that's one of the things about communication and conflict resolution techniques, tactics, is people think they're so disingenuine. They, they yeah. lack character. It's all like, oh, you're just manipulating me. Yeah. It's a prescription approach. It's like, say this right. or, or do this. Yeah. Instead right. Of and you're just, internal. and Emo, you've got all these phrases that you use, blah, 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 blah. And, but it seems so canned. And it's like, the reality is, is though you cannot do this without having it change your character. And that's what, I, that's what this whole point is. How do I take the inevitable conflict and use it to deepen the connection, turning conflict into closeness instead of avoiding conflict? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Now you got the whole story now. You got yeah. everything you wanted more. <laughs> yeah, that's great. No, I love that backdrop. We'll be right back after this brief message. And we're back. Well, let's dive right in. 
I think your first principle email is probably the most fundamental, assuming good intent. I first read your book several years ago after you appeared on Studio 5, and I had a sticky note up in my bathroom mirror, and I still have it there. Can I tell you which one it is? It says, I give you permission to not be perfect, (laughs) and I will still love you. Right. That's my mantra to my my husband, to myself. I give you permission to not to not be perfect and I will still love you. Assuming good intent, you say, is like nonstick coding of the heart. Right. It doesn't let the other's hurtful behavior stick. I'm still working on that. <laughs> Please walk us through why why that's so important in conflict are, and communication. Right? Yes, I think so. A work in progress. When when we get when we get in a moment of disappointment, okay, there's, we have this kind of expectation that things should be always smooth because we love the feeling of things being harmonious and, and, and this beautiful dance of connection. But in that process, there's going to be a misstep or, or a miscommunication. As soon as that miscommunication happens, we our limbic system kicks in and says you're just getting rejected you're not known or you're not accepted right now in that disappointment we kind of panic we're like that that fight or flight reaction is telling us we better correct the other person they are insensitive mean um selfish And so this principle of assuming good intent is a strategy to hijack the limbic system. Most strategies, even by experts, would say that you need to hijack that limbic system by controlling your physiology. That is a beautiful idea, but it is very impractical, okay? If you're in the situation and you're getting frustrated, they're frustrated, the likelihood of a successful, I've got to kind of manage, I'm gonna take some deep breathing exercise, I'm gonna calm myself down, I'm gonna try to get my heart rate down so that I don't go into the fight or flight, or I'm gonna go for a walk. Those are avoidance tactics in conflict. Although, love the idea, they're impractical. In that situation, we need a tool in that moment that's more accessible than a timeout. Yes, we will need timeouts, but if we're always going to timeouts, then we will never work through the issue in the intensity that creates the emotional breakthrough. So assuming good intent is a skill that you develop over time. And assuming good intent is so much more... um, sophisticated than being having a positive outlook or being like optimistic assuming good intent is the ability to create a story that puts the person's behavior in a context where they want to feel good they want you to feel good and they're doing the best they can if i don't have a story to support the positive attitude Well, then what will happen is I'll create resentment. So assuming good intent is how do I explain this person's behavior in a way that actually makes sense and doesn't slip into what some, you know, scientists call the fundamental attribution error. Okay, so when I'm disappointed, there's a impulse to explain the reason why I'm disappointed by pointing out some character flaw in the other person. They're selfish. They're mean. They're insensitive. They don't care. See, that's character flaw pointing out rather than situational misinformation. I missed something here instead of, you're an idiot. So assuming good intent is the, when we talk about that character change, the effort I put forth into seeing you as a loving, kind person, you're my partner for heaven's sake, that may have a misunderstanding or may be reacting out of your own insecurity. So if I can get to that point, then it's not about a t- 
tactical intervention. It's an emotional connection opportunity. So now I can go, she just bit my head off. Like she literally just snapped at me. She's so selfish. She must be hurt. Why would she be hurt? What, what's going on with her that she would be frustrated with me? I'm practically perfect. There's got to be an explanation. <laughs> the process of me going through that inventory, that assessment, creates a character change and sends the frequency of intimacy before I open my mouth. So I take the time. You know what? She's been home all day. She's got three kids under the age of five. There's no reasonable woman that's going to be still have plenty of patience and, you know, an effervescence of positivity at 6 p.m. That's an impossibility. So when she snaps at me instead of me going, man, is she selfish and rude and hurtful? She doesn't even appreciate the effort I put forth in trying to create a beautiful, you know, relationship at home. No. Instead, I go, I'm going to rescue her from her frustration and disappointment because telling her she needs to change her attitude will never work. OK, that's <laughs> you're, just get the sheets out and set the bed up on the couch. You're there for a while, <laughs> but you show up with assuming good intent and you're like, you know what? She must be having a really crappy day. And if I really take my time, I can probably understand why. Now that gives me the words to say, hey, babe, I can see that you're really not in a good place. I can, you're probably exhausted with the kids. You're probably stressed out. You've got so much on your plate trying to get everything done. There's no way you're going to be able to be always Miss Perfect. And that's totally okay. Notice, even if I'm 100% wrong why she's mad, I create a sense of closeness. Because she'll explain to me why she's mad. Like, I'm, if I'm off, she'll let me know. And if I don't take it personal because I'm assuming good intent, it doesn't justify the bad behavior. And that's what a lot of people say. Well, isn't it, you're saying it's okay. No, I'm saying I'm okay. I'm okay in a situation that doesn't feel okay. I'm okay. And if I'm okay, then I might be able to help her. But if she's not okay, which gives me an excuse for me not to be okay, that's three or four days of misery. And that's okay? No way. I want to be in the moment, connect with her, because after that moment, she's like, Emo, thanks so much for understanding me. I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. Mwah, mwah, mwah. That's what I want the outcome to be. Not, I'm justified. I have boundaries, and I will not be treated like this, and so I'm going to be a butthead yeah. about my boundaries. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So that's the power of assuming good intent. That's why I start with it. I, I love that you start with that, because in my mind, I... I have other words, you know, with understanding and compassion and seeing things from their perspective. Yeah. We assume that maybe they're having a hard day. There's other things that are going on in their life. But man, they're still a wonderful person who's under some stress. Or, or is... Right. They're the person that loves you more than anything. Yes. So there's got to be a better yeah. explanation yeah. than them being selfish or rude or inconsiderate. Yeah. Ah, mm. oh, man. I, I love that. So. So you start with assuming good intent, and then in your book you talk about um, criticism. So you talk about how criticisms are a, a catalyst for a conflict, but you also talk about how criticisms, criticism, they always have a grain of of truth in it, right? And so, mm -hmm. and you talk about you're on a mission to, to kill criticisms. Tell us a little bit about right. that of turning you know conflict into closeness well, and, and criticism. I'm so I'm so glad you you asked that question because if you're a fan of Dr. Gottman. Criticisms are one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Yeah. Okay? It shouldn't be done. We shouldn't be critical. We should use I statements or stuff like that. Okay. How long have we known that we shouldn't say always and never? Yeah, forever. So we need a tool to not like, we, it's, it's very, it's unproductive to point out the other person's criticism as a criticism and think that they would say, you know what, that's a really good point. I need to use an I statement. <laughs> that's not real. No, that doesn't no, happen no. in the that's, real world. It doesn't happen. People don't go, you know what, that, I can totally see how that was 
you know, hyperbole, and I probably shouldn't use always and never, and I probably shouldn't be so emotional when I share this, assuming good intent that you... No! The real world is someone feels something, and they share it, following the fundamental attribution error of you're an idiot, you're selfish, you don't care, you're being mean, you're thoughtless, you're inconsiderate. That's a criticism. And what we do normally is defend our pride and our ego by pointing out how it's not fair. Until, like, I have never seen anyone spontaneously say, you know what, you're right, I was being very critical and I wasn't being very fair. Okay, that's not what normally happens. What normally happens is a double down. Oh yeah? Always? Let me explain to you how it's always, instead of, well, eh, you've probably got a good point, it's probably only 80% of the time instead of always. Like, eh. So what we need to do is prepare for reality. Hoping people aren't critical is a terrible approach to deal with the inevitable conflict. Since criticisms happen, I should prepare for them. And so killing criticisms is what I call addressing criticisms by agreeing with the element of truth. All criticisms have a range of truth from zero to 100%, right? That's... That's the whole gamut. Yeah. When we get defensive, we actually feed our insecurities, which sets us up in the future to become reactive and defensive again. It takes and creates emotional confidence, self-love, self-esteem, when we can evaluate the amount of truth to a criticism even if it feels hostile. In that moment of, you know, disappointment and there's that sense of hostility and criticism coming to me, if I can train myself to just what's true about that, what's true about that, which is not natural, okay? What's natural is get defensive. So we train ourselves to embrace it using the principle of assuming good intent. I'm going to agree with the part that's true. Nothing more, nothing less. Emil, you left your clothes on the floor again this morning. You always leave your stuff out. Always means really, really important. That's all it means. I agree with what's true. You know, lately, I have not been putting my, putting my stuff away. I have not been taking care of my clothes. And I'm leaving them on the floor. And I can totally see why that really be upsetting you. That's it. I don't apologize. I don't say I'm going to fix it. I just own what's true in the moment. Based on what she says, it will tell me what my next line will be. And she only has four options. Criticisms, questions, declarations, and commands. And I have to do it in that order because my fingers don't work the other way. <laughs> so criticisms, questions, declarations, commands. There's only four. If I can take care of a criticism, I create self-esteem because I'm not valuing myself based on her emotional outburst. I'm valuing it based on who I know I am. When I listen to that voice of who I am and I own my flaws, that actually creates character. So we develop the character so that we're better able to love, which makes us pretty lovable people. So killing criticism is important because it's kind of the antithesis of telling people not to be critical. It's like, since we are, let's prepare for it and not use it as a weaponized therapeutic approach. Yeah. But we embrace it as an opportunity for us to be therapized by looking at ourselves and seeing our flaws. If there's no truth to it, we say, what do you mean? Okay, don't just say, you're right, I suck, you're amazing, I'm a terrible person. No, we truly take an internal evaluation of what's true. You know what? I have been distant today. I haven't been very affectionate. I haven't been very communicative. Ouch, that's so true. Then the other person can say, well, what's going on? Why? Notice that's a question. Criticisms, questions, declarations, and commands. There's only four. Once we know how to deal with all four, we can handle people who are high, crazy, which means our kids. We can handle it with our kids. We can, we can deal with kids that are making statements that we're like, oh, no, I'm going to explain things to you. I see parents do that so often that we try to explain things to the kids as if the kids say, you know, when you when, when you say it like that, it makes so much more sense. I think I really appreciate the, the curfew you've given me. <laughs> yeah. 
Not my Are team. we nuts or what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, mm-hmm. that's that's the killing criticism. Yeah. Yeah, beautiful. In your book, you can turn conflict into connection. It's really for all relationships. And I, I want to point out too, this is not a, a quid pro quo agreement. I'll do this if you do that. Right? Emil, it's I will do this right. no matter what. Right. I will do this no matter what. Tell us about someone in the business world you worked with who was really offended by one of his subordinates, I believe. Do you know what story I'm talking about? Yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, so I met with this type A red personality, okay, which usually those CEO types are. Yeah. And we were having a conversation and uh it makes them so good at what they do right oh yeah that's right they're so ambitious they're so motivated but he was kind of opening up and confiding in me of how just absolutely frustrated hurt i mean he was sick to his stomach he couldn't eat he was just livid he couldn't sleep and and the story was he had this sales guy top sales guy in his company like has been great and he had worked for the company for over 15 years. And so this guy, his number one sales guy, um, got to it, got to where he wanted more money, right? And so uh, the CEO was like going, look, I, I can't pay you anymore. Like, I, I, I've already tapped, you're topped out. And so anyway, that was really frustrating to the guy who was doing sales. And so he says, you know what? Then I'm out of here. He quits. Well, there's a, there's a non-compete you know, that he signed long, long ago. And about four months after he quit, he started getting phone calls. Uh, uh, The CEO got some phone calls about, hey, um, we just switched over to this new company or did you know that so-and-so is actually recruiting these companies to go with a different company? And he's like, you've got to be kidding me. Notice, disappointment. Hurt, frustration, betrayal, fundamental attribution, error kicks in. That guy has no integrity. He is a liar. He is, I can't believe him. He is mean, malicious, and ungrateful. I gave him a beautiful severance package when he left. Even when it was on his terms. He, I can't believe what a jerk he is. I have been so wronged. Okay, so that's the story he has. Can't sleep, can't eat, is preoccupied by this. There's no end in sight, okay? We're now into legal interactions. They got attorneys involved, all sorts of stuff. And he is a victim of the circumstance. And so I start to talk to him. I said, hey, um, with these type A personalities, you have to be very, very careful because they love to be in control of every conversation. Oh, yeah. (laughs) And so, and so I said, hey, are, are you open to another way of looking at this? Which is fantastic for type A personalities. They're always open to another way because they're so open-minded, right? And so I said, um, let's do an experiment, a mental experiment. Okay, you don't have to change your mind, but let's do a mental experience. Let's walk through this process I call assuming good intent. Wow. And he goes, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's not even go there. There's no way you can justify this person's behavior. I'm like, you're absolutely right. There is no way I can justify this person's behavior. Terrible. He he, he violated his non-compete. He should be prosecuted to the fullest level. Um, But you're suffering now. And I think the suffering can be dealt with. Can we do a thought experiment? And he's like, okay, let's give it a shot. I go, okay, let me, so let me see if I understand this right. We're going to open your mind a little bit. You knew this guy for 15 years. He was your number one guy. You trusted him with your business. You, you love this guy like a brother. Now he changes his whole character in a few months. I go, let's apply the principle of assuming good intent. He wants to feel good. He wants you to feel good or at least not be hurt, and he's doing the best that he can. Oh my gosh, Emil, this is killing me. Oh my gosh. So I go, let's just let's create a story. It doesn't have to be believable, right? And let's just create a story. I said, so so we started to kind of have this conversation, 
And so the outcome, the story that we created was, here's this guy who was, who felt underpaid. He felt like he really had, he was being undervalued. So he quits. And I can only imagine that his, his wife is saying, yeah, look, you, you've been working all this time. You should get more money. And so now he can't get a job in another industry because he's been in this industry for 15 years. So now he's running out of dollars. He's losing some money now. His bank account is really low. And so now he's super, super desperate. But he's too afraid to reach out to you because of his pride. And so out of desperation and maybe even some pressure from home about, hey, we got to figure things out. I don't care what the non-compete is. You got to get something going on. Whether that was maybe his wife is putting pressure on him. Maybe his kids are. Maybe he's putting pressure on himself that he can't provide the way he was. And out of desperation, he reaches out to another company. They hire him. And in order to start to get some momentum with no intentions of making this a habit, he reaches out to someone he had a real close relationship with. And out of desperation, he gets that person to sign up. And then he gets another person. So he doesn't want, he's trapped, he is stuck. He has to take care of his family. And he's too, I don't know, maybe he's got too much pride to come back to get his old job back. And so the situation puts him in a corner and he decides to break the non-compete. And as he's listening to this, he's going, man, that would be totally like him. I could see because he's one of my top sales guys. I, I know he's got pride. That's one of the things that makes him so amazing. And I can only imagine how hard that must have been to have him wake up and realize that he can't just abandon ship and get into a bigger ship. Mm. Man, that... I can see why that would be a rough place for him. Wow. Yeah, it's wow. Not, just the story, that story changed the way he felt. Mm. And with peace and understanding, he could continue the legal process, but literally give him a hug at the disp deposition. <laughs> hey, I understand that you probably were in a really bad place to break that non-compete. It's cost our company thousands and thousands of dollars and lost opportunities and legal fees. Stuff that I wish I didn't have to do. But I know the only reason why we're in this situation right now is because you must have been in a real pickle. Hmm. Hmm. Now, how does that guy feel? Oh, it's total change. He's like, yeah, we want to come down with a hammer. Well, if we come down with a hammer with all of our anger, then they justify their behavior after the fact. Well, you're a jerk, so I'm glad I did what I did. And if this costs you thousands of dollars, I don't even care. At least I'm getting you. He had peace. He had comfort. They were able to go through the legal process and, you know, fix things the best of his ability. Still had to lose a lot of things. But he didn't have to give up his peace. Bad things happen. How we handle them will either make or break us. So if we want to be justified in being angry, great. Keep it if you want. But if you want peace and power, start applying some of these principles. Yeah, man, that's powerful, Emil. I, I think that when, um, when we view others differently, then we start treating them differently. It's this paradigm shift. We have more compassion, this awareness, this, this understanding from, from their... We, we hear their story. Even if we make it up yeah. in our heads, wait, right? We see their story, they become real to us and then we treat them, yeah. them differently. Right. So powerful. Um, you know, in the book, you use uh, another metaphor when we talk about conflict and about, uh, you talk about the art of fencing as far yeah. as responding to the two to attacks. Walk us through a little bit about what do you mean? How, how do, should people respond to attacks when they are being attacked instead of attacking back or getting defensive? What do you suggest? So, First, I have to just say, it is natural to do the fight or flight, okay? That's impulsive, but just because it's impulsive doesn't mean it's what we want to do. So I broke down conflict into four, there's only four statements in conflict. There's criticisms, questions, declarations, and commands. 
And I challenge anybody to come up with a statement that doesn't fit in one of those four categories. With those four categories, there's three responses. We've talked about killing criticisms. We agree with what's true. If there's no truth, we ask, what do you mean? Okay. With an embracing attitude, not a defensive one. Number two, questions. When we get a question, we answer the question. Answering the question has the other person reevaluate the information and then make another criticism, another question, or a declaration or a command. So the third one is a declaration. A declaration is a statement about the person speaking or the situation. When we get a declaration, instead of trying to correct or explain, all we do with declarations is we validate the emotional experience. Someone says, I can't believe this. I'm done. Sounds to me like you're really surprised and exhausted because blah, 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 blah. We don't defend ourselves. We don't explain ourselves. We don't correct it. We just understand the crap out of the other person. When we take the time to understand them, we create a sense of safety. They have oxytocin that gets released. They feel less defensive. And literally, we change their chemistry. We change their chemistry by the way we respond to their declarations. When people are validated, they feel good. They feel understood. They trust you. Well, with that kind of an attitude, now we can get on the same page. We can work through whatever misunderstanding we have. And the fourth one, the command, we treat this, a command the same as a declaration. Usually a command is an effort to try to regain control when they feel like they're out of control. Leave. Walk away. Leave me alone. Okay. Those commands are a desperate attempt to try to regain control. Well, if we capture the emotion, I can see you're frustrated. I can see that you're upset. You feel really hurt. You don't feel heard. You don't feel supported because of blah, 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 whatever the context is. Where it normally would be like a mic drop, end of the conversation, actually kicks it back into the gear. Yes, I don't feel heard. Another declaration. You don't listen. Criticism. Why did you do this? Question. So once you know, it's like playing whack-a-mole with four moles. And, and the process of staying engaged creates a climate of understanding so that we can work through the issue and create closeness in the process. It takes a lot of training and discipline, no, but, but it's not like rocket science. This is doable mm -hmm. stuff. To create new patterns, that's really the key. So the problems are not really the problem, Emil, right? How we handle problems are the problem. You, you mentioned something about a, a volleyball court in a minefield. Do you mind telling us more about that? So in relationship interactions, there's these topics. And when we don't know how to handle those topics and they're not resolved, they become like a, a landmine in our lives. And so... What the traditional approach is, is we flag them and tag them. We don't talk about my mother. We don't talk about religion. We don't talk about this. We don't talk about that. You, you. And so next thing you know, we've got landmines all over the place and we're tiptoeing around the world. I don't want to set off any landmines. So, I mean, that's not a very comfortable way to live. Like when I hear the words, when I hear the words, well, we're just going to have to agree to disagree. To me, it's like landmine because they're not going to agree to disagree. That's an avoidance strategy that just means when someone steps on that, shrapnel and body parts everywhere. So we need to disarm the landmines. And what happens, we use these tools of understanding and communication. Let me reverse that. We, we create understanding from the communication and from the understanding, then we make resolutions, like commitments to do things differently. The process is what creates the closeness, not the solution to the issue. Husband and wife come into the office. They're on the tail end of an argument, so I'm just watching the show. And the wife's kind of wrapping it up they're sitting on the couch and she says with the money i make i'm going to pay this bill this bill and this bill with the money you make you'll pay this bill this bill and this bill fine fine hmm. 
problem solved, right? <laughs> they don't like each other. There's no yeah. closeness. Yeah. So when people put too much emphasis on the resolution of the problem, rather than the, sol- the, the process to get there, the solutions don't create the closeness. It just takes one more reason away for us to not fight, which actually becomes a tool for later when someone messes up as an opportunity to fight again. You know what? You said you're going to pay this bill, this bill, and this bill, and that late, that bill's late, and so you need to, and then it's another fight again. So solutions shouldn't be the focus. Connection should be the focus because I don't think anyone ever runs out of problems in their lives. They just graduate to different ones. And if the process is what we're devoted to, then no matter what issues we have in our lives, the one thing that we never have to compromise on is the closeness and companionship of the intimate relationship. And that's so nice to know is that it's not like when we become perfected, we will be loved. No, it's we will be in, in this, this beautiful dance the whole time of our lives just by following a few simple principles. Simple, not easy, because it takes training. Mm-hmm. Wow. So in your mind, Emil, you know, let me ask you, what is the, what's the key to a stronger marriage connection? I mean, j- summarize it for me. Just a l- Okay. Here's what I would say the key is. To develop the ability to seek, receive, and respond to feedback. When we are anxiously engaged in getting feedback, then we're always ahead. We're always one step ahead. But if we're hoping that the other person will accept us the way that we are, we're delusional. Yeah. Okay? Because if they're thinking the same thing as you, that's called a stale mate. Okay? No one's doing the loving. But if I'm seeking and receiving and responding to feedback, I'll be so much more potent in my interactions. I'll feel more confident because I'm ahead of the game. Hmm. So developing the ability to seek, receive, and respond to feedback, I think is a key factor because then it changes our very attitude about the relationship of taking a responsible, active part in creating the relationship rather than expecting it just to be something I should just assume. Yeah. Well, that's great. And if you had a magic wand email and and could help couples in one particular area, what would it be? Man, that's a beautiful question. If I could magically have everyone see the hurt and the insecurity of the other person, and they couldn't see that, you know, that fundamental attribution error thing kick in. As soon as they heard some snippy, snappy, you know, passive aggressive statement and all they could see was the hurt and the insecurity of the other person, we wouldn't need all these tools and tactics. Mm -hmm. Like our hearts would just bring us, oh, babe, you seem really upset. Talk to me. What did you understand? What did you think? How did you, how are you feeling? Instead of, oh, I don't like this. That would be, Mm -hmm. oh. If I had a magic wand, that's what I do. I love it. That's and great. and what else? Just last question, please, Emil, from our interview today is, what would you like um, our friends listening here to know about how to increase their closeness and connection? Make your marriage a priority. You got to put the time and effort into it. When you put the time and effort into it, it should be like working on a golf swing or working on a recipe. It's not work, it's joy. And so if you make your relationship like, and you you approach it with purpose and intention, then you're gonna address the issues that would normally kind of turn things sideways. And you can kind of weave yourselves together in a very secure relationship without losing your sanity or your soul. So, yeah, that would be it. That's great. You know, hey, where can I loved our conversation? Um, where can listeners go to find more about you, your resources, your book? It's super easy. Um, I have a website, emilharker.com. So my first name and last name.com. And um, 
my mission is to make a million marriages more amazing. And so it's opportunities like this to be on your fantastic podcast. And, and I really appreciate you inviting me to be a part of this. And, and so people can get my book. They can actually get it for free. They have to pay shipping and handling. But my hope is that when people get this book and they go, oh, wow, there's a real recipe that can change my relationship, even if I'm the only one doing it, there's, I create a sense of hope. And that, that hope, like, David, David, you know that, I mean, with all your research, the impact of solid marriages on society, I probably opening up a can of worms with you, but you go, you know, for hours. But if we don't make our relationships a priority in our marriage, then we are fundamentally, you know, destroying society. But when we make the marriage a focal point of our effort, we solidify our society as we know it and make it even better. So it's it's super important for us to make our marriages a, in a priority and then do the things that are necessary to create that closeness. Man, wow. Awesome. It, this has been a great uh, discussion, Emil. Um, Dr. Liz, what's your takeaway of the day from our discussion today? You know, a conflict can either be constructive or destructive, right? And the answer is me. It's all up to me. Can I see the hurt and the insecurity in my partner? And if I can, then I am much better off, right? I'm going to create those new inroads of not what about me, but what about him? What about you, Dave? What's your takeaway? Yeah, my takeaway of the day, there, there's been a lot of uh, great points and principles and, and stuff that we talked about. I think I, lo- I go back to uh, almost where we started, the assuming good intent. I just, I love that principle because it, it, evol- it evokes that, that compassion, that perspective, that under- understanding and awareness, that paradigm shift. All of that, I think, is so key, so fundamental to everything um, else that happens in relationship is to remember who that person really is. See them as, as a partner, as a spouse. Is the person in your life who who means the world to you, and, and despite you know the words and the, the some, you know the attacks and the stuff that come out, assume that there there's good intent behind that. Find that that message behind all the mess that they're that they're talking about. So, oh man, uh, Emil, this has been such a great um, conversation today. We sure appreciate you taking time to come on to to join us today. It's been a uh, another amazing um, episode. So. Um, yeah, but we bid you farewell. Thanks again for coming on. And to our listeners, thanks so much for joining us um, on today's episode. We hope you'll enjoy uh, listening to our, our podcast, sharing it. We also want to throw out an invitation for you to give us feedback. Tell us uh, guests that you would like to, to have on the show, what you think about the show. Um, we hope that you'll continue to, to be involved and listen to future episode, episodes. So for now, my friends, we'll see you. See you. Thank you. Emil. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, do us a favor and take a few minutes to subscribe to our podcast and the Utah Marriage Commission YouTube channel, where you can watch this and every episode of the show. When you hit the like button and leave a comment, your feedback helps us improve the show. And don't forget to share this episode with a friend. You can also follow and connect with us on Instagram at Stronger Marriage Life and on Facebook at Stronger Marriage. Be sure to share with us what topics you want us to explore or what you loved about today's episode. If you want even more resources to improve your relationship connection, visit our website at strongermarriage.org, where you'll find free workshops, webinars, relationship surveys, and more. Each episode of Stronger Marriage Connection is hosted 